and one that the New Testament says that the New Testament says is the son of David according to the flesh but has been declared the son of God according to the spirit of holiness. I can't take any more from your question, brother. I have to move to the other mic. You'll have to put the mic back on the mic stand and relinquish the mic. Let's give our brother a question. I mean, a hand for his question. <laughs> My brother right here. Yes, I would like to know about the uh, Mason theory. I'm sorry, I can't. Mason uh, theory. The Mason theory. The Masons. Yes, sir. Yeah, what, I want to know, what, what is that about? Brother's question is about the Masonic order and the Eastern Star and the Shriners. Some of, and all of our Greek letter organizations to some degree are an outgrowth of that. Omega Psi Phi, Kappa Alpha Psi, Phi Beta Sigma, uh, um, Alpha Phi Alpha, the sororities, Delta Sigma Theta, Alpha Kappa Alpha, Sigma Gamma Rho, and uh, Zeta Phi Beta or Z Phi B um, come out of the Masonic order. Um, then you have a Masonic order called the Skull and Crossbones Order. You have the Scottish Rite. You have the Free and Accepted Masons. And among the blacks, you have the Prince Hall Masons. But the Masonic Order, my brother and sisters, the Masonic Order is a secret, white, closed society. They integrate just about everything, but there are some secrets that they do not reveal to the black Mason from the black Masonic Lodge. It is ritual that is talking about our history. They talk about a man who was the master builder, who was hit in the head at the east gate, carried on a westerly course. These are the secrets that they talk about. Carried on a westerly course, buried in the north corner, under an old rubbish heap, and a sprig of evergreen or cassia was placed on the grave to show that there was life still in the grave. Searchers were sent out, three to the north, three to the south, three to the east, and three to the west. They were looking for the master builder, Hiram Abiff. And it said that once they found him, he would be in a shallow grave. Somebody would have to come with the lion's paw or the eagle's claw or the master grip that wouldn't slip to raise him from a dead level to a living perpendicular and stand him upright, they say, on the square. Now, all of this is talking about the black man. In the book of Kings, in the Bible, it talks about the widow's son and how Elijah would come and raise the widow's son. And so the Masons say, oh, Lord, my God, is there no help for the poor, oh, widow's son? The black man, we are the ones who were hit in the head at the East Gate, Africa, carried on a westerly course buried in the north corner where we are right now, Canada all the way down, in the north corner where there is no light, America. And we're in a shallow grave. It's not deep enough to hold us what the white man has put on us and what he's put us in. We can get up from this condition. But somebody must come from God with the lion's paw or the eagle's claw, metaphorically speaking or symbolically speaking, or the master grip that won't slip, that will teach us the supreme knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that will raise us from a dead level to a living perpendicular and stand us upright, righteous, and on the square. Now, the black woman is called a widow in the Masonic order. She's called a widow because the black man has been killed. He's been struck a blow, the Masons say, to the head which rendered him dead. Struck a blow to the head which rendered him dead. And if you remember in the Bible, the history of Lazarus, Lazarus was dead. He represents the black man. And the etymological root of the term Lazarus is L-A-Z, as in L-A-Z-Y, as in L-A-Z-A-R-U-S, Lazarus, the lazy one, the one hit in the head, the blow that rendered him dead. He's buried in a grave, according to the Bible, in the Masonic order, for four days. The four days represent the 400 years that we've been here in the hells of North America. If you remember, the women were awake. They were alive. Lazarus, the man, was dead. The black woman is not as dead as the black man. So teaches the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan. So we sing this song in the church, oh Mary, don't you weep, oh Martha, don't you mourn. 
They say Mary and Martha were weeping and moaning, and the shortest scripture in the Bible is Jesus wept. You know it because you got to say that blessing before you stick your hand on your mama's table. You're looking at that piece of cornbread or that piece of that drumstick or that thigh or that breast, but you know you better say a blessing, so you say the shortest one you can. Jesus wept, and you reach <laughs> for what it is you wanted to take. But Jesus wept means Jesus cried. What made Mary weep and Martha moan and made Jesus the master, the savior, the redeemer, the son of the true and the living God? What would make him cry? It's because Lazarus was dead. Jesus was crying over Lazarus being dead. So the question you must ask, since the Bible is written in parables and symbols and metaphors and similes, you must ask the question, who is Lazarus? symbolically and metaphorically in the scripture that would make Jesus the master cry. Lazarus is the black man. So when, the, when Jesus the master appears, the one who will save black people, the redeemer of black people, it was the women wide awake who told Jesus, Master, if you would have been here, he never would have died. And they showed Jesus where Lazarus was buried. The women took Jesus to the tomb where the man was dead. That's why in the book of Kings she's called a widow. Because the black man who used to build pyramids, as two kings in a cipher would say, we've gone from pyramids to projects today. We've signed our death certificate, as Brother Ice Cube would say. We've signed our death certificate. We've been robbed completely of a knowledge of self. And so the black man has to be resurrected today. And the Masons talk about this. The Masons wear our flag. The black man, my brother, who didn't want to be called a Muslim. Give me a piece of that white chalk over here, brother. Let's work with it here on the black bull. Again. The Masons wear our flag, where the crescent with the star turned upside down. Why do I say, brother, that this is our flag, that this is our flag, the flag of the black man and the black woman? It's the flag of the black man and black woman, my brother and my sister, because a flag flies over the area or the domain of the people. And this represents the universe. Our flag never comes down. Our flag, the black man, the original black man and woman, your flag never flies at half mast. You are the people of the planet and the people of the universe, 196,940,000 square miles and 76 quintillion miles throughout the distance of the diameter of the universe. But the white man can't wear the flag right side up in the Masonic Shriner order. He has to wear it upside down with a sword running through it. He wears it upside down with a sword running through it, and the purpose of the sword is to remind him that if he reveals the secret, what is the secret? Letting the black man and the black woman know who they really are, and letting him know, letting them know who he really is. So he's told that his throat would be cut from ear to ear, the Masons say. May his tongue cleave to the roof of his mouth, May his right hand lose its cunning, and may he be disemboweled and his bowels thrown out to sea at high tide. So all of this, brother, as I close out on that, all of this has to do with the history of the black man and the black woman. So the mason, the white man, is the maid's son, the shriner who is looking over the tomb of the god or the shrine of the dead god, the black man and the black woman who have been hit in the head at the East Gate. Brothers and sisters, it's now time for us to uh, wrap it up. We only had the auditorium for a certain period of time, and we have to close out now. Let us stand. Brother um, Donnie, did we do what was necessary? Did you do the charity and all that? We'll pass it unless we can't hold the people any longer. Uh, but let us stand, brothers and sisters, and friends and visitors and others who have come. I thank you for being as attentive and as kind as you have been. I look forward to being 
black again in the area at some time in the near future. We won't say when right now. We'll let you know. Make sure that we get everybody's name, address, and phone number. Do we have everybody in the auditorium's name? Did everyone sign in when you came in so that we can contact you and let you know when we'll be back? We're also going to work on getting the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan to Canada. <laughs> we hear that they have banned him, and so we want to fight to get the ban lifted and find out what all of that entails or find out if it's actually true. So where are the... I don't understand. Where, <laughs> I, don't even, I don't understand why they weren't already in place and why we didn't anticipate. Is there, are there, is there one on the other side? Do we have another one at both of the doors where you can move back down the aisle and one down this sister? Sister, we can have one down those steps as they go down and one brother, one down those steps as they go down. But let's pass it now. They're still working to have, just let it go, bro. Oh, hold that, hold, brother, I want you to pass him up. He's digging now. Just, instead of holding it, brother, let them handle it and let them pass it. Brother, excuse me. There you go, there you go. How many of you understood what you heard today? Let me see your hand. Hands down, how many of you believe what you heard to be true and good for black people? Let me see your hands. Hold them high if you believe. Hands down. I just wanted to see. Let's quickly pass the, the uh, donation box, I guess that's what we call it. How many would like for us to come back again? Let me see your hand. You like for us to come back? You sure? All right, we'll be back. Remember, go home and take all them white Jesuses off your wall. <laughs> Put a black Jesus up. He's called, uh, brother, we got to use the initials JC. You down with black JC? Yeah, you know me. You down with black JC. We got to take the white one down. Let's pass it very quickly. Ooh. What's the phone number? Right on the board. Brothers and sisters, stay tuned in to the Black House. Hurry, brother, just write the number on the board. Here's the number for the Black House, right here in, where am I, Montreal. The what? The Black House. For any information, for liberation literature, for tapes and books and many of the authors and scholars that I mentioned, videos of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, many of my tapes, you can get them at the Black House, and this is the number. So brothers and sisters, a little bit about your involvement with the Nation of Islam, how it came about, and what you do. Well, uh, by the grace of Almighty God, I'd like to begin first in the name of Allah who came in the person of Master Farah Muhammad. In the name of all the ancestors and the great line of divine, the prophets, the apostles, and the brothers and sisters, I'd like to send greetings to you from Dr. Khalid and Minister Farrakhan of Assalamu Alaikum. Well, brother, my involvement with the Nation of Islam, I've been in Islam for years, and I've been doing community work and doing shows and, you know, put a certain venue on security. We, we, we seem to want to get into the minds of our people and more give them a certain higher consciousness and understand. So my involvement per se is just being part of the work and doing what I have to do by the grace of Almighty God alone. Okay. Yes, Maybe for people who are not familiar with the nation, uh, you can give a little description of uh, its, its origins uh, and some of its basic uh, principles. Well, back um, the nation of Islam is approximately now in the Western Hemisphere, 63 years old, but as the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that Islam has no beginning, no ending. It was here before or with the creation, and it will be here when after the creation is gone, you know? But um, the Nation of Islam actually started from Master Farad Muhammad, who came to the Western Hemisphere and taught the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in 1931. And he taught the Honorable Elijah Muhammad from 1931 for three and a half years and left 
Up to this day, they don't know of his whereabouts, but they know he taught the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who only had a three and a half year education. You know, and this man, from the teachings that he received from Master Farad Muhammad, he was able to organize and galvanize and put together not only an organization, but an organization that has become an institution, not only here, but abroad, all over the world. Now, what kind of activities is the nation involved in where you're based, in New York, and uh, also in Montreal, where you do some work as well? Well, in New York, right now, we have been involved with the rising of the consciousness of our brothers and sisters out throughout New York. We've been um, into community affairs, interacting with the Hebrew, the Christian community, and all, finding a commonality and a unity amongst us, like the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan wants us to do. You know, our job, not only there in New York, but abroad and here in Montreal, which we're planning to find a commonality, regardless of religious perspectives and theoretical perspective and philosophical perspective, we want to find a commonality amongst black people, regardless of linguistics. You know, we want to find this commonality so we can be able to promote better unity and start networking unity around here in Montreal and around the world abroad. Uh, how has it been building bridges in New York with, for example, the Jewish community or, let's say, um, other areas of, uh, of black community organization like um, mm -hmm. Afrocentric organizations and so on, and the churches, mm -hmm. uh, the Christian churches? What has that been like? Well, I, by the grace of Almighty God, I've been myself seeing a resurgence of consciousness in the black community, not only in the Muslim community, but in the Christian and the black Hebrews or the Hebrews themselves. They, everybody's teaching black Jesus, black prophet, and starting to realize by studying and going into the Bible with a black theology and going into the Quran and going into their other studies and their other histories, not only by the help of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the help of his ministers all around the world, but by the help of historians like Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, Asa Hilliard, um, Dr. Jeffries. These people are bringing cert a certain horizon, a certain consciousness, uh, a, a, certain, a certain power, some, some kind of black power movement is happening right now. And I couldn't really explain because it's so vast. You know, but it's stemming from not only from Canada, but it's hitting from Canada to America to Africa, where Africans and Americans and Canadians are interacting with one another now. They're they're starting to get more, more love for one another, and you know, Africans not down in Americans like they used to now. We're more getting over there and getting dual citizenship with the African continent. So we're doing a great job, regardless of what camp you may be in, we're doing a very good job into bringing a, a certain consciousness or a certain state of mind into our people. Yeah. Now, I know that one of the Nation of Islam's basic demands, as spelled out in its program, yes, is that there be a separate state or territory established for descendants of African slaves yes, in the United States. I wonder if you can elaborate on that and how, for example, black people in other parts of the pan-African world fit into that. Yes. Um, from, from the time the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad has been teaching, he has realized that integration and all the other tricks that we may say of this society has failed us. Because the problems that's happening today, my brother Anthony, um, is more of a problem. Separation and segregation is more a problem now than it was with Martin Luther King, than it was with Malcolm X than it was even when the re various other revolutionaries was alive, Matt Turner, then Mark Vesey, all these different revolutionaries. And we find that if these certain things that American society or the society in general have set up to try to com bring about racial harmony, harmony is not working, then separation would be the best solution. And this is what the messenger, um, the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad has always been teaching, and this is what Malcolm X taught for a period of time, which even when he came back, he still didn't allow them in his group. Um, this is what Minister Farrakhan teaches up to this day, and we still promote that because we feel that charity begins at home, and we must learn to clean our own backyard first, then we jump into somebody else's backyard. What kind of person would you be to go clean that man's house and didn't clean your own house first? So it's very important that we learn to do for ourselves first, and then equally, on an equal level, sit down and coexist with another, other races of people. The Chinese can clean themselves up, the Japanese clean themselves up, 
let the black man and woman who has been downtrodden, knocked down, and beaten for so many years, for 430 odd years, let us do for ourselves instead of somebody always speaking for us and always trying to put their two cents to help us solve our problems. You know, so that's why we feel separation is very important for the time, the time limit, the time that the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has set up for us. How do you respond, for example, to people who say to you, well, that kind of program um, and, and say the kind of program that would involve setting up separate schools for black children and so on, that kind of program is, is ghettoization and we're, we're restricting ourselves and our children to uh, exposure they could get that could help them and so on and so forth. How do you respond to that kind of criticism? Well, it's so funny that these people that make these, these statements and criticize us have never tried it. So how would they be able to know about it if they have never tried it in their life? They've been caught under segregation, they've been caught under a society that oppresses us, and not just um, under disguise they oppress us, but they are openly oppressing us and showing us through their system. So they can't criticize something that they have never experienced themselves. So we feel that they should first try a thing, just like they've tried integration, They've tried segregation. They've tried various other shuns to, to, to try to bring about harmony. Why not try the separation and see how it will work amongst us solving our own problems? We know, and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us, that we know even if we eliminated the, the oppressive government right now, we would have problems amongst ourselves. But let us settle our own problems. Don't show us your way of settling our problems. Let us do it. So we, we, we welcome criticism and we deal with it accordingly. Okay. Now, one question on uh, the nation's stand on interracial marriages, which it explicitly prohibits. Why is that? What is the, uh, the, the reason for that? Well, my brother, we, ha we believe and we know by history that interracial um, marriages didn't wasn't happening because of love at one point in time it was happening because of the lust of the slave master and the slave master is the one that intermarried or came in and just went to the backyard of the barn to come and rape our black brothers our black brothers and sisters mm -hmm. i have to say black brothers and sisters because they do promote homosexuality in certain states not going against that if certain people believe that that's up to them mm -hmm. but we believe in the natural courses of things of production and all that but interracial marriages, we say, we put a stop to it because we know it's been hypocritical. If you, the, like the minister Farrakhan said to us one time, or said to all of us one time, he said, how can you love that black woman, or how can you love that black man, and you don't even love that black man or black woman's father or great-grandfather? These are the same people that uh, prop up interracial marriages, but yet, they still keep us under the same segregated laws, the same segregated tool, and want us to follow the same status quo of society. And when we begin to start talking, or children that are produced from these interracial couples start talking black, most of them will start down in their children and say, no, we're trying to get up out of that instead of teaching the two cultures and let the child choose for themselves. So we believe interracial marriages should be prohibited, and that's what the messenger taught, and we believe that we should, like I said, charity to begin home, begins at home, and we should learn to clean up our own backyard first. Yeah. You know? Now, we've seen movies recently, uh, for example, Denzel Washington, the Mississippi Masala, <laughs> yes, sir. and uh, also, it was Whitney Houston, uh, with um, Kevin Costner? Yes, sir, Bodyguard. Yes, in sir. Bodyguard. Do yes. you see some kind of a pattern or, or <laughs> motive in that? I mean, why would Hollywood be making such a big thing out of something they, they always used to stay away from in the past, mm. TV always stayed away from? Well, like the, the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, that integration is a hypocritical trick to make us believe that our 400-year-old enemy is now our friends. So in order to promote this and being that movie is a a basic mechanism to to get into the psyche of people. They use movie and media and television to capture the minds of people to do such a thing, which is like a survival method. This society now is going through survival. They're trying to have their race survive. The only way their race can survive is by inserting their seed 
or inserting themselves into us or intermingling with us because they know deep down in their scholars, scholars, all their scholars, their scientists know that black people are divinely, divine people. They were the original people and they know that their, 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 their people are doomed to destruction because of all the things that they have done to us. If these people believe in the Bible or scriptures, it tells you that your sins of the father shall fall upon the third and the fourth generation. Mm -hmm. It tells you this in the scriptures. So they know that they're coming to a doom. That's why they're, they're doing strategic things mm -hmm. to intermingle with us and also pull us to their destruction with them. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we yeah. wake up. <laughs> now, I know that the Nation of Islam does a lot of work with brothers in prisons in the United States. Uh, what do you think is the reason for a lot of brothers being attracted to the Nation of Islam and its teachings, um, a lot of brothers in prison? Well, again, brother, like I said, you've tried everything else. Try this and see. And most of the brothers that come out of prison, or matter of fact, most of the brothers that go into prison, they have the propensity to do right and to be right and to become science and do scientists and doctors and lawyers. But this society already sets up a certain, a certain um, pattern where we lead ourselves into a self-destruction mechanism. So when we get into the jail system, we teach them about themselves, which this society has never taught us about themselves. We don't teach their children that we're slaves. We teach them that we were kings and gods of society, that we built the pyramids and most of the historical monuments that you see today that they call wonders of the world because they're still wondering how we built it because they always see our faces and our footprints everywhere the, um, this, um, the people of the society went they always seen black people so what we do we go into the jail system and promote not only strong leadership not only black men but black women because the woman is important you understand so if we as the nation of Islam go into the jail, these jail systems and these, jail, these jail, jailhouse institutions, the penal institution, we feel we have a program that will set all of the brothers and sisters in this straight mm -hmm. and make them become productive human beings in society. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I know that the nation also does a lot of work with brothers on the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've seen lately a kind of, um, let's say, uh, an idolization of the, the, the sort of hardcore brother from the ghetto and yeah. inner city American, mm. you know, thing through like rap music and through a lot of movies and film. Um, I wonder how do you see that whole kind of uh, idolization and what it means for young black men and, and how in the nation you could deal with that. You know, I'm talking, for example, like in the movie CB4 came yes, out, of, it yes. showed very graphically mm -hmm. how the brothers took on the, the clothes the guys were wearing in jail, yes, and you know, yes. you see that fashion now, yeah. the baggy sort of jail mm -hmm. clothes. I wonder, how, do you, how do you see that whole phenomenon? Well, one thing I realize about our people, they're very creative. They can take something that looks like a, what they may call an Urkel style, and make something totally different out of it to make it a hip-hop style or something. We believe that hip-hop is a revolutionary, revolutionary music. Through hip-hop, we can teach the young to do for self. We can teach the young knowledge of self. I mean, there's positive and negative in any, everything, and we don't really promote the negative. But we understand why they're teaching the negative because the negative is a reality in the community. So this is why they have become to idolize these things. It's a reality in their, move, in, their, in their communities all over the world. You go into Chicago, you go to New York, you go to Georgia. This is a reality. You notice, if you notice the trend, everybody is actually dressing the same. You notice that everybody is either mimicking New York or L.A. And New York, whatever New York or L.A. is doing, whatever they're doing, believe me, that's the best thing for everybody else to do. If you're the best, bad, or the roughest guy in town in New York, you're the roughest everywhere around. That's why people seem to look up. I even notice people in Montreal here look up to New York styles continually. They keep on producing more styles and we keep on looking up. We believe that we also should produce our own styles. But we understand why our brothers in the what you so-called ghettos are mimicking or idolizing because this is their reality. And we support their reality, and we understand rea reality because we didn't drop out of the heavens. 
we came out of that same ghetto that they came from and we have to go back with the same language to bring them out of it so that's our job as far as working with in the, in the streets with the brothers and sisters going in there and get them speaking the language like the messenger taught us the messenger always said speak the language of the people whether, you, whether it's from the ghettos or into the suites of the big hotels or in the office they will speak the language of the people and it's very important because, you know, th this sort of style is an attraction for kids who, well, never mind even like middle class, <laughs> or upper middle class black kids, but mm. also white kids and kids yes, of all different sir. races, you know, and it's um, yes, sir. it's something to, to wonder about what, what that says, you know, why they would find uh, some kind of attraction or mm -hmm. identity with that style, which in a way is quite removed from their own reality. Yeah, uh, that, you know, I've realized, I've studied the Village Voice and different magazines in New York and different, and realized that white kids are now speaking out for black oppression because they're not to blame for what their ancestors done. It's the only thing that they are blamed for is to make it continually go on the same way it's going on. You know, and right now we're not down with what's going on. And we're not going to keep on going on with what's going on. And now black, white folks are starting to understand this. And they're bringing more of a destruction on their own society or their ancestor society faster by helping us do or helping us promote the culture. Because, you know, I've read in certain magazines where white people say they love the culture. They love the rap. They hear NWA, NWA niggers with an attitude they hear ice cube they love public enemy but public enemy and them is teaching revolutionary rap why would they love revolutionary rap because they see a change happening the young will see the visions and they will see ahead of the old they're seeing the change amongst black people they some young white folks know that black people cannot stay in a corner forever just like a cat if you corner it it's going to eventually jump out on you and become something that will rip your throat or rip at you to get to some kind of safety. So I understand where white people are coming from, the white youngsters are coming from when they want to idolize, because we look like we have fun when we're doing it. We look like we're enjoying ourselves, you know, and I understand that, you know, and I respect that, because some, it, there's many white people that would like to help our struggle, but, brother, uh, there's very few that can really get up to the higher echelons of a Bush or the Congress to stop the foolishness that's going on and what's being promoted and what's being done to us, you know. It's a lot. Uh, now, I understand that uh, Minister Khalid Mohammed will yes. be coming to Montreal on May 3rd. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about him and what he'll be speaking on and some of the details of that, uh, oh, yes, of that visit? Yes, sir. Minister Khalid Abdul Mohammed is the National Assistant of Minister Farrakhan. He is one of the best if not the best debater in the Nation of Islam, one of the greatest minds in the Nation of Islam. And he is such a flamboyant person. He's a versatile person. He's the kind of person that the rappers look up to because he has this soldieristic look, not only with his shiny bald head, but people have seen them in videotapes with Ice Cube, X-Clan, Lynch Mob, Professor Griff, Sister Soldier, Chuck D, the Prime Minister Shabazz, Flavor Flavor, and the Public, the public Enemy. So they realize that this man has a certain zeal with him because he came out of the fraternities. He's a graduate out of Harvard, Yale, and Columbia. This man is a doctor of theology and science. So when he comes, he's not coming from, he, he went up to eighth grade and that's it. He went up to college level and that's it. This man has accomplished certain things. He has gotten the blue heart or the purple heart for certain, for certain activities he's done. He's spoken in various colleges. And this lecture that he's coming to do is one of the powerful lectures that he's done throughout the states. And we want to present it here in New York. I mean, excuse me, here in Canada. It's called Malcolm X, the man. His mentor, his message, his meaning, his murder, and the movie. Because we know a lot of people have a lot of questions. And there will be questions and answers. We wanted to have a debate with him. We wanted, we wanted the heritage, front, heritage group to come out. We wanted KKK, skinheads, Jews, Christians, Muslims to come out and hear this, brother. And if they have any questions at all, come. Because he's willing to deal with all challenges. He's always, he's, he's debated Jews, he's debated Christians before, he's debated the Ku Klux Klan in L.A. So he's not afraid of challenges. But one thing he realized that when these kind of things come about and and the event has a lot of tension in it 
the masses of the people that need to know will learn because they'll be wondering what's going on why are these people protesting against them you know and we expect this they did it already in new york they did it in chicago they've done it all over the world protests against them but every time he came out he is he is like a sword for the honorable minister louis farrakhan that will clear the path of anybody in his way to help his brother come true because the minister is doing a hard work he's setting up land schools we're setting up schools of education from kindergarten up you know so he has to have these strong ministers and by the grace of Allah I hope I become one of his strong representatives here in Montreal or throughout Canada or throughout the world so Minister Khalid is going to come with a powerful lecture brothers and sisters and I hope to see everyone out there like I said the powerful lecture on Malcolm X the man, his mission, his mentor, the murder, and the movie, what you just seen, three hours of it. But there was 39 years of his life, and this brother is following in the footsteps of not only the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, but also the Honorable, the, um, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X, because he's a national spokesman of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, just like Malcolm X was a national spokesman of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So you got to come and check it out, May 3rd. Right, and that's uh, at 1455 Demizinov Boulevard West, Concordia University, the Hall Building. And uh, for further information, you can call 514-278-6444. Right, 278-6444. Okay, well, thanks a lot for uh, joining yes. us today, Simon. Thank you. Good luck with your, your work. And I hope you enjoy this insert from Black Ears. Peace. <laughs>